So by the time I got in college, I was a full blown food addict. Carbohydrates are non essential. All the foods that I have struggled with and been tempted by the most are carbohydrates. And I didn't even have to eat them. And how did you find carnivore? Hi, Dave. Uh, may I just say first how much I enjoy your channel? I, I really have just uh, thoroughly enjoyed your approach and your heart and your passion. And, you know, in just a really short amount of time, you have really developed your own style. And now you're having interviews and inviting people like me in. And um, so I just I want to applaud what you're doing and give you an attaboy and say, keep going. So thank I, you so um, much. Yes, you're so welcome. So um, back in the, I guess you might say the keto zenith of 2017, when keto was really, really popular, I started hearing about it. And, you know, it was a word that I was not familiar with. I had never heard the word keto. I'd heard vaguely about ketoacidosis and, but not ketosis or a ketogenic diet. So you know, my, my antenna were out and I was curious. And um, I even asked a gal once and she said she was on the keto diet. And I said, oh, really? Can you can you tell me what that is? And and she tried, Dave, and tried. And finally, she said, you know, I really can't. <laughs> I can't explain it. I just know um, that, you know, you can lose a lot of weight on it. And I've lost some weight. And I think she was taking exogenous ketones, too. So her, her you know, approach was a little different. Um, but the, the thing that really tipped me over was, uh, so I'm married to a Presbyterian minister and he's also an adjunct professor. And he came home one day and told me the craziest story. And it was right around that time when I would had this previous conversation with a girl that um, really wasn't sure how to articulate it. And he said that he was out in public and somebody came up to him with a little baby on her hip and said, Hi, Dr. Watkins, how are you doing? And he knew he was supposed to know her, but he could not recognize her. And he would, could, you know, he's really good at names. That's, you know, part of what he needs to do for a living is to remember people's names, but he could not place it. And so he said, all right, I'll just let her talk. And so the more she talked, he realized, oh my goodness, she was in one of my college classes and she has lost a ton of weight. And this is why, you know, I don't recognize her. So she went on to explain to him that she had lost a lot of weight after she'd gotten married and that they were infertile at first and couldn't, couldn't even conceive. But after she lost all her weight, she got pregnant and, and there was the, the bundle of joy on her hip as she was talking to my husband. So he came home and relayed that story to me as he likes to do. And I thought, you know what, I am, I am really going to investigate this. I'm, you know, I had some motivations as well because I had my food struggles and, and had had them my whole entire adult life. So this was when I was 60. I'm about to turn 66 now. So that kind of gives you, um, you know, my, my background. Um, so, uh, so that was seven years ago and there was all this internet buzz and my husband's story. So but then I went online and I started reading and I came across different people that, um, that were talking about how they eat keto and keto in a day and different things. And so that, that was helpful. Um, but the main thing that really helped me, and I, I really want to plug this book was uh, Nina Teicholt's book. Uh, the Big Fat Surprise. I don't know if you've ever read that, Dave, but um, I highly recommend this. And she chronicles the food industry and the history of the food industry. And she talks about, um, you know, just all, all of the uh, evolutionary factors that have contributed to where we are today. And the whole back of the book, like an eighth of it, is just nothing but footnotes. And so all the articles that she read, all the studies that she went through, she puts you know in the back and so it's it's highly um annotated and I, I highly recommend that so i read that and for me it it just answered all my questions and it really took a book really because there's so much here you know um it, it's uh it's a fascinating story where how we have gotten to where we are today she takes you through that late 1800s with Ellen G. White, who's the prophetess with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and her alleged prophecies that meat is bad and that meat causes cancer, and even worse, that it results in 
um, sexual temptations for men towards self-pleasure. Um, it, she takes you through, uh, Reverend Graham, which is where we get Graham flour, which was, um, he was a vegetarian and he advocated for that. And his followers developed what they called Graham flour. And that's where we get, uh, Graham crackers. She takes you through the, um, the beginning, the origin of the American Dietetic Association, which was co-founded by Lena Francis Cooper. And she was a seventh day Adventist. She was a devotee of, um, uh, uh, Harvey Ke Kellogg. So that's what we get Kellogg cornflakes. So she just takes you through everything that Procter and Gamble, which who gave us our seed oils, which was a terrible, uh, a deception really, um, just purely driven through for profit. Um, and then, you know, Ansel Keys and his faux lipid hypothesis, which we all know now was just absolutely wrong and not based on science. He was an epidemiolo epidemiologist and not, you know, a really a scientist that could do studies that would show the mechanics or the, the mechanism for cause and effect. He just showed correlation. And then you can take that and build a case in any direction that you'd like to go in. And then of course that led to the McGovern campaign and the food pyramid in the early 1900s. So um, so I just ate that material up. I just drank it up and I, I couldn't get enough. And so, um, you know, I also went online and, uh, one of the early people that I followed, um, and some of your viewers are going to recognize this name, but his name was, um, Butter Bob and his, his last name is Briggs, I believe, Bobby Briggs. But anyway, he has this cult classic video that I watched early on and it's called Butter Makes Your Pants Fall Off. <laughs> and it is just awesome. I mean, it probably has millions of views and I don't think he's producing videos now any longer, but I think all of his old videos are still online and you can go and, and watch that. And um, so that kind of really, uh, that was the progression that kind of really got me going. And, and so then, uh, so why I chose to eat this way for myself is because, well, for a couple of reasons, one of which, um, so I was born in 1957 and that was right at the Genesis, right at the beginning of the processed food industry. So when I was a little girl, you know, we didn't have pop tarts and and we didn't have uh frozen waffles you know when we sat down to eat it was usually you know scrambled eggs and maybe some bacon and a piece of toast you know we just didn't eat processed foods now there may have been some of that around in, in the late 1950s early 1960s but that wasn't how i grew up we didn't have snacks we didn't have soda we only had dessert if it was a special occasion we never ate out and there was no such thing as fast food. So um, I'm thankful for that now. I can remember having to go ask my mother if I could have a snack, you know, can I go and get something out of the refrigerator and eat it? So we weren't snacking, we were outside, you know, and we were playing and we were riding our bikes and we weren't sitting in front of any devices or certainly not in front of television because television back when I was a child, you had three networks no remotes so if you wanted to change the channel you had to get up walk over to the tv and turn the knob and then half the time it wouldn't come in so you'd have these antenna a rabbit ear antenna that you'd have to move you know and um yeah so it was just a whole different world however because of when i was born and my time frame by the time I got in junior high and high school, fast food was really developing and it was coming in and not just restaurants, but it included fast food restaurants. I can remember when the first McDonald's came, you know, within a 50 mile radius of our city, didn't actually come to our city. I was uh, living in North Florida at the time. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but we did start getting pop tarts and Legos or Egos rather, you know, the frozen waffles and, and other things that, um, that were easy and quick and convenient and everybody was drawn to them, you know, and, and the government encouraged, you know, with the food pyramid that we eat a certain amount of daily, um, quotient of grains and fruits and vegetables. So, um, so by the time I got in college, I was a full blown 
food addict. And, uh, and I have been struggling with food addiction since I graduated from college, which was in 1980, until six years ago when I found keto. And it's kind of a bizarre thing to have to even admit or talk about that you've, you've struggled with uh, just food um, obsession, you know, and, and I've heard you talk about your issues, Dave. It's like, you know, trying to resist the urge to eat. How long can I postpone it? What am I going to eat when I do get to eat? Um, how long can I wait? Um, you know, what am I going to eat when I eat? And just every day, every meal in and out. And so um, I, I was kind of a, a very disciplined person. I was raised in a home where sports and fitness and athleticism was valued. I had two older brothers that uh, were all-star athletes. And then my dad was an athlete. He ran um, track and he, he was a high hurdler in, in high school. So I had um, good role models, you know, and so we all were just, you know, basically just depriving ourselves when we were hungry because we didn't want to gain weight and we wanted to, to stay in good shape. So I had that, but, um, so yeah, so, so my whole adult life has been trying to figure out how to conquer this beast, you know, and, and half the time thinking there must be something wrong with me or I wouldn't constantly struggle in this way. It wasn't anything I ever admitted or talked about. I would not divulge that to anyone because I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I felt like, you know, I, I should, I shouldn't be, you know, such a glutton or whatever. <laughs> so um, I'm, I managed uh, to, to, and, and despite all of that, I managed, I stumbled into recognizing that if I could postpone that first meal, and not eat breakfast until, you know, maybe eat a brunch at noon. I kind of stumbled into that, that, that I could, I could limit my calories that way. Um, because I knew in my twenties, I, I figured out the first meal that I eat, I'm going to be hungry after that first meal because my first meal always had carbohydrates in it. So I, I just stumbled into intermittent fasting that way. And most of my adult life, I didn't eat breakfast, and, but I love breakfast foods. So I would just wait and eat it at noon. And then I was raised not to snack, like I said. So I, 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 I didn't do a lot of snacking, but boy, I would go to bed hungry a lot. And, you know, that's just, I just became accustomed to that and got used to that. Like I said, my whole adult life, I'm, I'm now almost 66. So um, so when I stumbled across keto and I started learning um, what the ketogenic diet was and what a fat metabolism can do for you and the possibility that I could eat a certain way and maybe for the first time in my life experience satiation and food satisfaction, you know, I couldn't wait to get started. So, um, but I will say I was a little, you know, I was a little hesitant. It's like, okay, now I've been told my whole life that we're supposed to eat so many portions of fruits and vegetables. Okay. So what if I don't do that? What, what is that going to do to my body? And, you know, am I just going to like, you know, melt into the ground because I'm not eating all these fruits and vegetables. And, um, and I loved a salad. Boy, I could fill my plate up with a salad and pile it up and pile it up and, and just trying to get full, you know, eating volume in order to try to get full. So, um, so that was a big motivation for me. Just back to being a food addict by college, what physical and mental consequences were there for you um, being a food addict? Oh, that is a really good question. And um, I, I became a closet eater. You know, and I, I'm probably not alone in this, um, but, you know, you, in public, you don't, you, you have to control and restrain. And so you, you try to eat normal amounts or whatever. But I, I would just, I, my car would turn into, you know, uh, we, we have 7-Elevens in Florida, you know, a junior marts or whatever. And I would usually go to the, you know, go to if they had a deli and I would 
almost get another meal, you know, and then I'd eat it by myself. Nobody would be around and knowing that I'm eating it. And then of course I would feel guilty about that. And it was usually late at night, like in college when, you know, you're up studying and, you know, you're getting ready for different things, papers and exams. And so closet eating, I think would be um, one thing that, that I developed a, a, a habit of doing. And, um, and like I said, really, really felt bad about it. And it's kind of scary, right? Like, um, it, it's something that's so easy to spiral out of control. Um, it, it, it is. Yeah, I it remember is. as a, a child, like, waking up early and raiding the kitchen for all the cookies and all that kind of thing. And, and you know, doing it early because it was like I could sit in front of the TV and I could just chow down on all these cookies without anyone wanting you know but like if i heard someone wake up it was like back into the kitchen everything put away and sit in front of the tv <laughs> like you know it's it's kind of scary when it gets to that point right yes you you feel out of control and, and that that is a very scary feeling um but i never ever considered that it had to do with the types of food i was eating I never once thought that because, you know, our whole lives, we were told that we're supposed to eat the food pyramid. And so, you know, so there shouldn't be a problem. And um, boy, how wrong was that? You know, I, I when I started investigating and started reading and started um, listening to other YouTubers and bloggers, I can't tell you the moment that I learned that carbohydrates are non-essential. I, I was floored. I could not believe it. I felt like a child who had been told that there was a Santa Claus and then finally got old enough to realize there was no Santa Claus. You kind of feel maybe, I don't know how everybody else felt, but you know, you feel kind of like, oh, I was lied to, you know? Well, I felt so betrayed. And I, you know, who do you, who do you lash out at, you know? Because instantly I put it together. Carbohydrates are non-essential. All the foods that I have struggled with and been tempted by the most are carbohydrates. And I didn't even have to eat them because my body can produce carbohydrates in the form of blood glucose. So yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was a real shocker for me. And that's a first principle for me that I, when I talk to people and I try to encourage them, I try to go right to first principles. There are only three macronutrients and only two of those three are essential. And most of the problems that we have with food, whether it's food addiction, food cravings, allergies, health, illness, disease, they're, they're gonna come from that category of carbohydrates and that's the first principle that if you can help somebody that you're talking to see that you know once you you see that you can't unsee it mm. it's all and you know you you talk about that realization it's almost like you've been doing this jigsaw puzzle all your life and you're struggling to finish the jigsaw puzzle and it's that one piece you've been staring at that whole time yeah. um and it's just like oh that is the right piece i was just looking at it upside down this is <laughs> yeah. the kind of the thing with carbohydrates and you realize so i it wasn't me <laughs> yes exactly and and then beyond that you quickly or at least i quickly realized oh Okay, so over the course of my life, again, I was born in 1957, I've seen just an inordinate amount of weight gain, people struggling, you know, gaining weight, and now we have children who are obese. That was never seen when I was young. I mean, we all looked, you look at pictures of my age group when we were younger, and we almost look like concentration camp survivors because we are so much thinner than young people are today. Um, sickness, that has skyrocketed over the course of my life diseases that were never heard of you know i never heard the word alzheimer's until i was an adult i, ne I never heard it and looking back now i only knew of one person whose mother was diagnosed with alzheimer's 
Now, of course, we had senility and dementia and, and different things and who knows, you know, but I understand now that Alzheimer's is a, uh, a, a glucose intolerance of the brain. We, the, the, the brain cannot receive the sugar that it needs in order to be fueled because, um, because the, the body has become intolerant and, and the brain has become intolerant. I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now on the, um, the word, but, um, but anyway, so, you know, autoimmune illnesses, I never heard of an autoimmune illness when I was growing up. There were no autoimmune illnesses. I mean, technically there probably were, but you never heard of an autoimmune illness. You didn't even see people who struggled with their weight. I could remember in school, elementary, so ours was elementary and then junior high, seventh, eighth, and ninth, and then high school was 10th, 11th, and 12th. I only remember one person who was chubby during my whole childhood. You never saw it. And it, it was really sad because she did stand out because of, you know, she was, you know, she was the exception to the rule. And so, um, and I only had one teacher who was obese, only one. And, you know, she was one of my favorite teachers, but you just didn't see it. And if you don't have the benefit of perspective that I have, having lived through this and seen it with my own eyes, you know, you could wake up today and think that everybody's always been overweight or that everybody's mm -hmm. always struggled, struggled with allergies, you know? When, when did you get started with keto in earnest? Oh, really, within the first month. Um, I, I just said, I have got to try this. And so it was August of 2017. So, um, so I, I greatly restricted my, um, carbohydrates. I did, I wasn't <clears throat> at 20 grams or less, but I cut out all grains immediately, cold Turkey, no bread, no pasta, no rice, no potatoes, and anything else that would qualify as a grain. Um, <clears throat> and I stepped up my protein or my meat and the fat and, um, added in the butter. And that was back in the time when bulletproof coffee, you know, was real popular. And so I was putting the, the butter in my coffee, which I don't do now, um, and full fat cream. And so, um, yeah, so, and I didn't need to lose any weight, so I wasn't trying to lose weight, but I was curious to see what would happen, you know? And I could not believe, like within three weeks, Dave, I could not believe how great I felt. And it's so weird because you don't know how poorly you feel until you go through something like this and you get over here on the other side and you think, man, I feel wonderful. I've got so much energy and I wake up in the morning and I can't wait to get out of bed. And um, you know, all that, the backdrop of some little bit of depression and uh, a fair amount of anxiety is like lifted and I'm not overthinking things and I'm actually able to distinguish between thoughts and feelings, <laughs> which sometimes is hard to do. I don't know how many people have ever thought about that, but you know, a feeling is a feeling and a thought is a thought. And sometimes they go like this if you don't have mental clarity and I had mental margin, you know, I had, I had space in my brain to think about the things that needed to be really considered and seriously contemplated and then just the energy level i mean i already pretty much um was an energetic person especially for my age but the energy level just went through the roof i i i can't believe even to this day uh the energy that i feel and um how much i can get done and how much physical work i do which which i'm very thankful you know i don't have any injuries or anything and i'm not on medicine so um i do have hypothyroidism which is an autoimmune condition and i'm sure that's because of all those many years of the standard american diet but um it's never really altered my life in any way so um I mean, that's we, we've just passed the six year anniversary, I guess. Seven, 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 and seven year anniversary. Yeah. So, uh -huh. seven year anniversary. So, sorry, my math is out. That's okay. Morning. Mine's even worse <laughs> than yours, but I'm pretty sure it's seven. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, seven year anniversary just passed. 
at this point, what does a day of eating look like for you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, it depends on the meal. And um, I love that flexibility about this way of eating. You know, when I had children, I had, um, I, we homeschooled our children. And so they were with me a lot. So I had six children. And when someone would ask me if we were out in public, you know, if they got into a conversation with one of our children, they would say, well, what grade is she in? And typically I would say, well, which subject? Because when you homeschool, you have the flexibility. You don't have everybody doing the same subject at the same grade level. It depends on what their needs are or where they excel. And so that was something that I really enjoyed as a homeschooling mom. A little bit so, more like a Montessori style of learning. Exactly, exactly, yes. And um, so with this way of eating, um, it depends on the meal. So usually in the morning, now this morning I had um, a New York strip. OK, and I'll tell you in a minute how I purchase my meat so that if other people can can um, benefit from it. Um, and normally I don't eat a steak in the morning, but I had gotten some on sale and the, it was sitting in the refrigerator this morning, just calling out my name. So um, so I took that baby out and I put garlic salt on the top and the bottom and along the sides where the fat strip was. And I like to cook my steaks under my oven broiler and I and I cook everything there and because it's just easy and I use a cast iron skillet so I broiled my uh, New York strip and had that a boneless New York, New York strip now I haven't eaten since then um, so when we get done with this interview then I'll have another meal and today it's going to be kind of a flip-flop so normally I would have uh, pork belly and eggs for breakfast and then maybe a steak or a hamburger patty or pot roast or um, I love chicken and your know, dark meat, legs or thighs. And um, uh, so, but tonight I'm gonna have pork belly and a, uh, an egg. Um, I have a, a good friend who is also my neighbor and she has property and she has a barn. So we, we together have chickens. And this has been a kind of a, a more recent thing. After I went keto, she moved into the property next to our home and she has the barn. So we, we share, uh, we're both hobby farmers. And I let the chickens out in the morning and feed them. And she puts them to bed at night and closes them up. So I have farm fresh eggs. And so um, I, I really value that. And also, um, I can source pork belly here in this area. I'm in Western Kentucky. Uh, Paducah, Kentucky. And um, so there's a lot of easily accessible meats here. Like I'm, I'm getting ready to um, buy a lamb and I'm going to uh, take half of it and somebody in our church is going to um, take the other half. So, um, so, but pork belly, I love because there's nothing added to it. It's just what they cut bacon out of. It's a slab of bacon that has not been sliced. So, and I can get pork belly here very easily. And so, um, I, I love pork belly and I add salt to everything. I'm, I'm a big salter and, um, I need, I need salt because I exercise a lot. And if I don't eat enough salt and, um, you know, I'll get cramps. I'll get leg cramps, especially at night. Um, so that's so it depends on the meal. Now I do. I I am keto. So so the other two meals or the other meal is usually going to have a side of. Um, so w where I have landed at this stage is that I I really want it to be fast. I I want to get my food out, get it on the plate, eat it, and get on because I got things to do. I'm living life, right? I'm not spending time in the kitchen unless I just really need to. So I like to eat pickled vegetables like pickled okra, pickled asparagus, or just dill pickles, um, green olives, um, or if I want, I'll eat a half of an avocado. And that'll be either my third meal of the day that I'll have that usually later in the evening, or, or if I'm just going to eat twice, I'll usually put something with my entree. And I don't just eat steak. I eat, um, I make my own hamburger patties. I make them really, really thick. And then I run that under the broiler and, and, and I eat dairy. So um, I'll top it with um, preferably aged cheese, but not always. Um, so uh, that, uh, that sounds delicious. <laughs> New York strip for <laughs> breakfast, for belly and egg for dinner. Yes. Um, 
so i mean you you say you're keto but um you're also you're not eating that much in the way of vegetables so would you say you're probably more trending towards like i guess ketovore a hundred percent i mm. i love i love that name ketovore you know i mean it sounds a little unusual i guess but it re <laughs> it <laughs> it really describes what where so many of us land you know um and so i I, I also am trying to be an influencer and, you know, and I have a, a YouTube channel, but I feel like if I keep a little bit of vegetable in, then I have a broader, um, uh, I can cast a broader net because I think most people will find it easier to start a keto diet as long as they don't get too overwhelmed with counting macros and everything. And then they can decide, you know, how good they feel and what they want to do. And then they can go in any direction from there. Um, and the other thing is, since I am married to a pastor, we have a lot of families in and we go to other people's homes. And then we also have church meals. We have potlucks. And I made a decision a long time ago that I, I did not want to be that person who other people are afraid to eat around because they know what my standards are. So, um, and for example, we had uh, just a wonderful family in this last Sunday and guess where they're from? They're from India. So what do you imagine they wanted to eat when I invited them to my home to feed them? Rice and, and not a whole lot of meat. They're used to eating chicken and fish so um so yeah so i had a stir fry or i had a curry based chicken i had a wonderful uh pot roast um of uh, a brisket and then i had a big pile of rice now i never eat rice ever 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 like i said but i ate a little bit of rice so that when i sat down it, it was probably like a heat and um so i put that on my plate and and then uh, I don't know what else I had other than you know a lot of meat. Um, I think I had some okra, uh, pickled okra. So that would be like one spear, two spear. So my plate looks like everybody else's plate. But I'll tell you what was really interesting. I haven't eaten rice in so long, and I used to love rice. We used to eat a lot of rice. Um, I didn't enjoy it at all. I mean, it was like bland, boring. And you know how that is when you're used to eating rich food, which is fatty meat. <laughs> and then you go back and you eat something that you used to go like kind of shovel in because you're so hungry. You think, man, that wasn't even really all that good. And, and I can do that. I can, I can do that. I can put a little food on my plate and, and then the very next meal, get right back on board and right back up on the wagon. I'm not going to be tempted oh, there's more rice in the refrigerator left over, so let me get some more rice. I'm not tempted like that. So, and and I'm, I understand that some people just, you know, they wouldn't be able to do that, and I understand that. How is your husband with this? Has he kind of, he discovered his, his student before that he didn't recognize, so he kind of discovered this way. Has he, has he tried to go keto or do anything in that regard? Yes, he has. And, you know, it's interesting, our whole marriage, he wanted, he wanted me to cook foods that would help him keep his weight down. Now, and he's kind of like me, he doesn't really have a weight problem. But he's also has a history of being an athlete. And he, he's he values fitness, he's always gone to the gym. And I just really couldn't figure it out. You know, I mean, I, I just didn't, if I made something that was not wasn't high in calories, then it didn't taste any good and then nobody would want to eat it you know so i made you know some attempts at it but i could never do it so so then it's so funny now you know he he brings home the story about the young girl who lost all the weight and he still didn't think that that was something he could necessarily do or even wanted to try so um so i've kind of been pulling him along and he has come along it's you know it's been more of a process with him but um so he he pretty much eats the way i eat now and now if he goes to a, a a pastor's conference or if he goes to somebody's house he's going to pretty much eat what they have he's not going to stay on the on on the, the wagon i'll pretty much stay on it you know 
Um, but then he, you know, he, 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 he works his way back and his, his weight fluctuates because of it. But, but an interesting story about my husband, when, um, after we'd been married about 25 years, he came down with a neurological disorder called, um, oh gosh, now I can't remember the name of it. Um, but anyway, it was a, it's a neurological disorder that affected his, his face. Okay. It's called dystonia. There it is. Okay. It's in the Parkinson's family. And it first started in his eyebrows and he just had uncontrollable flinching his eyebrows. Then it moved down to his, uh, his you know, his forehead first and then his eyebrows. And he would just constantly raise his eyebrows. And we just thought, well, he's really, he's developed a twitch. You know, this is kind of interesting. And we didn't think anything of it. Then it moved from his forehead, eyebrows to his eyes. And he would just do uncontrollable blinking. And so the kids and I, you know, we would kind of tease him and said, you know, it would kind of come and go. And we say, oh, Don, your wink finks are back, you know, and, and we didn't know, you know, and then it kept progressing and, and then it landed in his mouth, you know, and so all of a sudden, his mouth is being pulled down and his the muscles and ligaments or tendons in his neck are pulling on his mouth and it's kind of pulling it down like this. So, you know, a pastor doesn't work for a living. A pastor talks for a living. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of a joke, but he's got to be able to talk. That's how he makes a living. He preaches and he teaches. So here we are and we've got now we've got a crisis so um we'd already left florida and moved to western kentucky so we were close to nashville so nashville has vanderbilt and has all these wonderful um resources medical resources so long story short he got his diagnosis of dystonia and um you know it's it's chronic and there's no cure but it, it there's no pain involved and it's not going to kill him you know so that that's all good and he's kind of in remission now and he started going into remission before he started keto um but i think and he's not necessarily on board with this but i think we may have done this to him now the medical profession will tell us that they don't know what causes dystonia just like they don't know what causes parkinson's and they'll tell you that it's probably genetic but we know now that you know things aren't as genetic as we've been told and there's a a wonderful uh, subsection of the study of genes called epigenetics and epigenetics is the study of how um how your environment affects the way your genes express themselves and the number one environmental factor with one's health is what they eat and what they put in their body so the reason i say that we may have actually contributed to this condition is because my husband you know not only did he want me to cook foods that were um, low in sugar and that could help him with his weight but he was fastidious about not eating fat because fat was bad right that's how we were taught so we ate um, turkey bacon instead of real bacon. We ate low fat uh, yogurt, skim milk or 2% milk, could not cook with anything other than uh, vegetable oils because vegetable oils were healthier than fat. And evidently, uh, I, you know, I could say neurologically healthy too, they would suggest, but in fact, um, not neurologically healthy and have contributed to a lot of illness and disease. And so, you know, we'll never be able to prove that this contributed or caused my husband's dystonia. But I tell you, I'm very, very suspicious. But that's that's cleared up now? That's all? It, it's in remission. Mm. So he, he has a trick. It's, it's, it's called a trick. When he talks, he takes his hand and he puts it in the side of his mouth and he pushes on the muscles. And so when he preaches, he typically is like this. And if he pushes on the side of his face, it relaxes the muscles in his neck and he can pronounce his words. But if he doesn't do that, then the muscles pull on his mouth and it makes it really hard for him to talk. And it also makes it hard for him to be understood. Um, but he's managed. He, he's really managed. I think the Lord has really been gracious to us because 
we weren't ready for retirement when he first got his diagnosis, especially with, you know, a boatload of kids. Speaking of the kids, uh, has anyone gone keto, ketovore, carnivore from uh, from your six kids? Well, yes, actually. Um, so our two youngest are boys, and um, and they're still home on and off. One's in law school, and he comes home on occasion. And then the other one, our our baby, is here full time. And um, so my son Hunter, who is our baby. He's the one that encouraged me to have a YouTube channel because I start talking about nutrition all the time. And, and, you know, after a while he turned to me and he said, mom, you should start a YouTube channel. And I thought that's the craziest idea I've ever thought of or heard. Cause I'm just like, so non tech savvy. I can't even hardly tell if my phone is on or off half the time. Um, but anyway, he, I, I wanted to share that with you because he not only helps me with my social media, but he has begun to adapt a keto diet. And so has my son, Evan, who is in law school. And their version is not just eating chicken all the time. They're now eating red meat. They're eating beef. And they're, um, they're noticing how, bet, how much better they feel when they, when they cut their carbs down and when they restrict it and they've added in eggs they're eating a ton of eggs and they and they do a lot of their own cooking so they're they're doing a lot of that and my son hunter it's really interesting um he he went to a school called lindsey wilson college and it's uh, on the other side of the state of kentucky and he's one of the few college students who had the the fortune of having a professor it was a health science teacher who actually talked about this in class. And this was before I knew anything about it. So this was the first time Hunter heard anything. He actually heard about it in a college level health science class. And the teacher talked about seed oils being really harmful. He talked about healthy fats. He talked about the immune system and, and um, a homeostatic, homeostatic approach to blood sugar. And so when Hunter came home and he was hearing me talk about the same things, he said, you know, I've got a professor who's talking about this at college. And so it's, it's helped him to kind of put the pieces together. So, yeah, I, I'm really grateful that, that our two youngest sons who are around me more than the others, because the others are, are out of the home, have really been listening and, um, you know, have really been, been taking note. And they've, and they've actually started feeling better. So, and, 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 and one has lost weight and feels better as a result as well. That's awesome. That's really good. And I imagine, um, just, just, you mentioned, um, your second youngest son is in law school. Yes. So, mm -hmm. um, you, uh, you've got to think that eating a diet that's high in saturated fat and animal products is, um, you know, got to be good for the demands of law school. And then what happens after that with the hours he's going to have to put in, right? Oh, a hundred percent. And and I really think um, that he's been able to tell a difference, you know, and, and I think that's really, you know, it, it's the way it works. Once you see what an impact it can make in your life experience, you know, you, it's hard to, to go back to the other stuff. It's like, you know, it's like going back to the pigsty and eating out of the pig trough when you when when you you know when you experience this other. So yeah, I think it has really made a difference for him. Um, and that's a that's a very appropriate analogy when you think about what is actually in regular regular quote unquote food. You know. Um, so uh, could you talk a little bit about your YouTube channel, please, Anne? Oh, I'd love to. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, I am Keto Gal Ann, and um, I am on TikTok, I am on Instagram, I am on YouTube, and I'm on Facebook. And um, on YouTube, I have um, shorts, I think they're called, and I also have some longs, I think they're also called, I have some videos. And I have one video in particular that's called The Power of Food that I highly recommend. It covers a lot of the material that I referenced earlier in uh, Nina Teicholt's book, The Big Fat Surprise. And, and then um, all my shorts and my reels are, um, you know, 60 seconds or less. And my son Hunter helps me with all of this. He's really good at, you know, at utilizing AI and editing and different things. 
And um, so my approach is I, I want to, I really want to reach people and I want to, I want to reach the, the maximum amount of people. So right now I'm just focusing on these short little brief snippets of information. And it's like, you know, trying to cast the seed like a gardener would, you know, or somebody who's trying to plant, plant grass in their yard. I'm just trying to scatter the information and it's, it's incomplete information. It doesn't tell you everything in one little bite size, you know, moment, but I'm hoping to wet the appetite of anyone who, um, who hears it and who sees it. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much just getting started, but I really enjoy it. I love uh, putting together my texts and really trying to prioritize and focus on those things that are going to be most helpful to to someone who who might hear them. Fantastic. Well, I'll uh, I'll link to it in the description and um, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, and and look, I really appreciate you coming on today and sharing your journey with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it.